let me f um, preface my remarks by, by just introducing us, the Allen Institute, because we're very different. Uh, we're sort of a very different animal from, um, from um, sort of academic or government organizations. So we are an independent, not-for-profit uh, institute. We started in uh, 2003. We do basic research in the neurosciences. We don't give out grants. Sorry, we, 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 we burn a lot of money. Um, we, are, we are still in our growing phase. When I came, we were 160. We're now 330. We're going to 500 people in a couple of years from now. The, they, uh, we are really somewhere in a culture between a university and a startup. We, we, um, we don't have independent PIs. We focus on a few very large uh, projects that, we, that can be done at scale and that require collaboration among very different disciplines, and then we execute. We now in a in a in a second 10-year plan, uh, so we have a 10-year runway. Well, actually, now it's reduced to six years. We have a six-year runway left, um, and it's roughly um, it's roughly a billion dollars um, over over this time. Um, and so this 10-year plan is really to build. Uh, to understand it comprehensively in mouse and in, in, in um, a human cortex, a tiny bit of matter, roughly one by one by one millimeter, to understand all the constituent elements in that, particularly all the different cell types, to understand all the different types of synapses, to understand their development, to understand the neuroanatomy, to understand it, at least in mice, in, behavior of, in, in the context of a behavior, and then to model all of that at a variety of scales, from very fine, detailed biophysical model to much more abstract point of population models. Um, we just moved into a new building that Paul, Paul Allen has given, to, uh, given us a couple of months ago. It's a gorgeous new building, all open space. Uh, and so we're all together, 300 of us in a couple of years, 500 of us scientists, engineers, and other specialists focusing on brain. So this is our donor, um, Paul Allen. The vast majority of our funding comes from uh, Paul Allen, who... Um, uh, who, who really wants to understand how the brain works. This is not about making any money. We have right now no patents. We have uh, everything we do, we, do uh, we put online. So we are about uh, big science, not at the scale of LHC, but certainly in the scale of uh, biology and neuroscience, where a typical lab is 10 or 15 people. Uh, we assemble a large team and then open science, in the sense that everything we do, we put out for anybody to download freely. So. And this is not in theory, this is not in the future, but this is actually, we've been doing this since more than 10 years. Well, all the data that we produce is publicly accessible via API. Once they pass internal quality control, you don't have to get a login. You can download everything we do without any commercial restriction. And all the data are accessible, typically uh, two to three years before uh, the, the associated papers come out in Nature or Nature and Your Science. That's where almost all of our papers ha have come out. Um, somewhat similar to what uh, Karl Heinz show, showed you, we also have a ten, we have a detailed ten-year plan. But if we really reduce it, since we are sort of more in a startup, rather than giving you a book, we have a one-page chart that we give everybody to put in their wallet, so we all know where we are and how uh, where we have to go. And this is what we promised Paul. This is what we promised our external advisory boards. We get uh, we we have external advisors coming in, checking us out, so that we remain on on track. We have product releases three times a year. We just had one last Thursday, and we work very, very, very hard, just like in a, bio, uh, in a, in a tech startup, in order to meet our deadline for our data releases. So we're doing all sorts of things for the community, particularly we're pushing hard, working with many in the community to uh, build standard uh, protocols. So we can all exchange data called Neurodata Without Borders. So whether it's EFIS data or two mm -hmm. photon calcium imaging data, we can all use the same data and the same meta metadata. We give out, we've given out close to 20,000 transgenic mice now, um, hardware, special purpose electrodes, et cetera. So we study two, uh, the brains of two animals, mouse and uh, human. They differ by a factor of a pr uh, pretty close to 1,000 in terms of mass, in terms of size, in terms of volume, in terms of area, in terms of number of neurons. Uh, we are focused on neocortex, which is, of course, only part of the brain. We focus on neocortex because it's a very flexible 2 plus epsilon dimensional computational tissue. Right in us, it's roughly as big as this, like a pizza, 14 inch. 
two to three millimeters thick. You have two of them highly you know, rolled up and, and put inside your skull. And if you look in other animals like whales, where the, of course the tissue is much, it's much bigger, the width is more or less the same, or you look at the smaller animals like a mouse, again, it's, 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 um, it's a thousand times smaller, it's a, it's a square centimeters, but again, the thickness is roughly the same. It varies between 0.9 and three millimeter. Um, we also, it's also relatively homogeneous across cortex. Of course, there are many differences locally. And so the belief is that, some, that to first order, it's translational invariant. To first order, despite all the differences that people know of, it's translational invariant. There's some uniform computation that's being performed in a part of the brain that people typically refer to as a column, and that doesn't have to be anal about the column. It constitutes a useful working hypothesis that there's a, sort of a, an elemental canonical um, um, and computation that's being performed in this, in this column, and we are really trying to understand it from a basic biological uh, point of view. Here, it's remarkable similar. One of these tissues, this is part of cortex, one of them uh, is human, the other one is mouse. It takes an expert armed with a microscope or a scale by in order to see which one is which. So we all, I always stress the, sim the great similarities between human and the mouse brain. Of course, there are differences. People always ask what makes humans special. We are as special as any other species is, right? We, we have specialization, so does any other uh, species. We don't know at the, there are many differences. We don't know the difference that makes the difference between us and mice. The one relevant difference that we all know that people typically acknowledge is the size difference. So our brain is, as I said, there are, in cortex has 16 billion neurons versus 14 million in a mouse. It's roughly a square centimeter in terms of volume, and it's roughly 1,200 square centimeters in, um, in, in area in, um, in, in, in human. That's, I think, the biggest difference. So to look at the, the, the similarity of the architecture of cortex, particularly the transcriptional architecture, we did this, we released this a couple of years ago. We did large scale in a thousand locations in each of six different brains. We did um, microarray technology. Um, uh, this is a lot of data. And, and I, it took us uh, uh, four years on a highly standardized condition. And the output of this, of this is for summarized here. You can, uh, you can, this is a really very useful um, visual tool and you can download, you can go to our website and download it. What this shows you, any two places, there are 290 different places in the brain and you can look what's the difference in terms of uh, uh, genes that are expressed, that are transcribed between this place and this place or between this place and this place. And here it's expressed in a log space, uh, in, a, in, a, in a color space. So blue, there are very few differences above, a, uh, um, above threshold. And red, there's large difference. So what you see are the two relative, the three relatively homogeneous areas, particularly down here. That's the cerebellum. So of course you all know the the vast majority of neurons in your brain are here in the cerebellum. Cerebe um, of your 86 billion neurons, 69 billion are in the cerebellum. Um, and they're very, they're really very, very similar to each other. Even in cortex, neurons transcriptional described are relatively similar. There are of course lots of differences, but they are much more similar to each other than to any other. Um, um, compared to any other part of the brain. The, uh, these genes are very consistently expressed. So this is the expression because we use exactly this. We have the standard operating procedure where we do exactly the same thing uh, over and over. So we do this in six brains. And you can see this is one particular gene. And you can see the pattern. It's expressed in these different brain areas in six, in six different brains. You know, uh, one female, um, two African-Americans. So they're different, uh, different ages, different genders, different ethnicity. But you can see there is, at least among a very large fraction of the genes, a great deal of homogeneity from one brain to the next. Now, interesting, if you do PCA, now if you just focus on the, on the transcriptional architecture at the level of cortex, you do PCA, you can show, you can roughly explain half of the, vari uh, of the, of the variance by, by space. In other words, uh, if you now just, if you unfold the cortical sheet, this pizza, I didn't put it down, and you ask, what's the difference in terms of genes expressed between any two places? Half of that difference is just is given by distance. The farther two places, the farther the, the, the two places where you sample your, your, your cells are apart, the, the, and the larger the difference. So it really tells you something very physical about this tissue. Right? And, and, and close by, it's more similar than, and then far away. So, um, so this great similar, this, uh, 
And these sort of results lead us to expect, once again, that, that there is something very homogeneous uh, uh, um, about cortex, although acknowledging that there will be these gradients that are ultimately going to be expressed gradients in receptors in various proteins. So um, our biggest project is called Project MindScope, which probably has right now 250 people focused on, where we just look in, in a standard uh, lab uh, mice, uh, C56, J animals, uh, they're all 56 day old, where well, we look at the visual system. We're focusing on the visual system, not because it's a particular good model of the human visual system, it, it's not, it doesn't have a fovea, it doesn't move its eyes nearly as much as we do, but it's a perfectly decent uh, piece of cortex, and we really understand vision reasonable well, it's probably the best understood mo uh, modality. So there are roughly 40, uh, 45,000 neurons that come up from the, from the eye, go through an intermediate relay in the LGN, and then end up in cortex. There are roughly a million neurons in various visual cortical areas, a third of a million in primary visual cortex. Now we do everything by the way within, we define this and we've refined this over the last 12 years, a series of ever more accurate atlases. So now our latest atlas is a 3D volumetric atlas where we have pixels, 10 micrometer pixels, um, where we can locate any neuron that we record, whether it's using electrodes, using optical physiology, doing anatomy, we always can place within this 3D framework with high degree of accuracy. This has, um, at this voxel level, it has a third of a billion voxels, the entire mouse brain. <clears throat> so we have these large uh, data production pipeline. So we have one, uh, and I'll briefly mention, uh, I'll briefly talk about this. We have one pipeline just for uh, generating high resolution connectivity data. We have another pipeline for generating uh, quite reliable slice data in the slice of, of the individual neurons that, that we want to understand, characterize. And then we're building these brain observatories. We'll release the first data in three, in three, one, uh, three months from now on June 3rd, where we image in real um, uh, image and make available uh, cellular-based data within a very high-resolution framework within a both a structural and a functional framework. I'll show, show that to you. Now, what connects all of these is that they all use the same animals. It's visual cortex of young adult C57 black 6J mice. All, of, uh, every, all the data is mapped, as I said, to this, uh, to this uh, common coordinate atlas that we got by averaging data from 1,675 animals, so it's very precise. And we all use common Cree lines. In other words, we all use common transgenic lines, and we make these transgenic lines available to the community. So that's a great advantage. So, so we know then, if we are talking about, let's say, a layer 2, 3 line that expresses fluorescent labels in layer 2, 3 pyramidal cells in visual cortex, we make that available to other researchers, and we're all talking about exactly the same animal. It really leads to a high standardization. And all of this data goes into a highly standard, a centralized and standardized limbs. Um, a database. All right. So this is so we've done this now in several thousand mice, where we inject um, a, a virus with a fluorescent tracer that carries a specific promoters into a specific part of the brain. We have six trained neurosurgeons that do this day in day out, so they become very very good at it. And then we slice it. Then we wait two weeks and we slice the brain in 140 slices and we scan in. We have six of these machines running in parallel, where we scan in high resolution two photon. Uh, tomography essentially in um, in 3D and then where we informationally reconstruct them and 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 make them available. So the first the, the first version of this that had 300 brains is um, um, came out a couple of years ago. And of course, this is not the, the raw data. The, the, you, we have access to the raw, you have access to the raw data as well as process data. This, of course, not the raw data because I couldn't show it on my, on my Mac. But you can really follow now these, these neurons very specifically throughout the entire brain, right? So we inject here and re, in the mouse brain and then, re, and, and then reconstruct it through the entire brain. So this gives us, for example, a connectivity matrix. This is a connectivity matrix of 300 animals. So think each, um, each, um, um, row going across here is one animal where we made one injection, let's say, in the medulla or in the pons or in the cortex. And then we look, and then you can see the, the um, going down the rows is um, where, where does this uh, projection go to? 
again, it's a logarithmic scale here. It's a logarithmic color scale. On the, left, um, on, the, on, the, on the left side, you have the right hemisphere. So we always inject in the right hemisphere. So you see uh, where it projects you in this hemisphere. And on the other side of the slide, you see the targets on the contralateral hemisphere. So it gives you a complete picture you know, you can think of this as a crude version of WIJ. It's not at the single neuron level, but it's at the level of mesoscopic discrete populations, at the mesoscopic level. All right, and so you can see, uh, unlike, uh, unlike, for example, you know, social networks, it's a very densely connected, typically 30 to 40 percent of all the entries have entries different from zero, but the amplitude of the connectivity weights vary greatly. They're log normal distributed with probably uh, across five orders of magnitude. So it's not just that an area projects or doesn't project. The, uh, this, of course, makes life for modelers and theoreticians very difficult, but this is very typical of, uh, of brains. Um, so, for instance, for visual cortex, where we are uh, focusing on, you know, there's a total input, different areas, that, uh, 42 different areas that project into, into pr a primary visual cortex, and at least 34 output projection to 34 different areas. That's the brain. Now, the other complexity of real brains compared to neural networks is there are many, many different cell types, right? So we realized roughly 200 years ago that all uh, biological organisms consist of cells. And then we realized, okay, they're heart cells and kidney cells and skin cells, and now we know they're brain cells. And then, of course, neuroanatomists, starting with the late 19th century and in combination with the, the, the dye industry, developed all these specific dyes to light up specific cells. So we know they're Purkinje cells and they're photoreceptor cells, etc. So now, we know, for example, in the retina, just to do something that computationally you might think is very simple, i.e. converting a stream of photons into action potential, takes uh, roughly 80 different cell types. And you understand nothing in modern neuroscience without referring to cell types. It's really absolutely essential to understand um, what type of neuron you're recording from and to try to understand its specific role in a specific behavior and its specific role for specific computation. So how do you identify cell types? It's, it has been done. The only place where it's been done pretty exhaustively is in, in the retina. It's not been done exhaustively in cortex. It's much more challenging in cortex. So, so we use a combination of different techniques. We use connectional properties. We use physiological properties. Um, the three-dimensional morphology, both of local, the local dendrite and axon, as well as the distal axon, as well as the genes that are expressed. Right. And then we use that in combination with a variety of models. So we do electrophysiology on a, sli on a standard condition in a slice. In other words, we take slice from visual cortex or LGN or higher order visual areas. And we, under very standard condition, we have this pipeline, uh, uh, which is now manned by 20 people who do this day in, day out, recording either with one electrode or patching with four electrodes or with eight electrodes in order to, do, to get uh, synaptic connections among these neurons. And then we reconstruct neurons. Or we have sort of the semi-automatic pipeline using a variety of different models, either sort of all active models um, uh, that we do in combination with the Blue Brain Project and Henry Markham, um, then um, um, models with passive dendrites and active um, uh, Hodgkin-Huxley conductance at the soma and point models. Because we want to see, um, and then also we use population models. We'd like to understand what sort of models do you need in order to replicate what function? Because I, I, I suspect that although I spend most of my life, of course, doing detailed uh, dendrites, that for many aspects of computation in the brain, you don't actually need dendrites. All right, then we have, we have a variety of point neurons. You can download all of them, so not just one. We have, you know, LIVs and, and LIVs and GLIVs and GLM, um, uh, a variety of different um, uh, point models. And then here you can see, for example, this pipeline generates. These are uh, some of the cells that are automatically generated. Uh, in black, you can see the experimental data. In red, the simulated data, both for spike trains as well as for individual spikes. And all of this is that you can, as I speak, you can download all of this data. This is um, Allen's cell type database. Um, this shows you on the left the, loca the location. Most of them are in visual cortex, primary visual cortex. Of course, occasionally we also record from and, and from other areas. And at some point, we'd like once we've 
once we've satisfied ourselves that we've really completely understood the characteristics of cell types in V1, of course, then we want to replicate this in different areas to try to understand to what extent is it really the same scheme? Is there a canonical cell type scheme that's replicated in V1 in all the other areas? I think there is with, with, with gradients. So I think the basic result will be the same, but then there will be these gradients that are superimposed. Anyway, so you can go to this website, you can click on an individual neuron, you know exactly where it is, you can click on it to get its, its uh, morphology, you can click further to get its detailed shape, you can either get the individual images or you can get a three-dimensional reconstruction of its morphology. You can click here to get the individual data. All the, uh, all the, the trial runs have passed quality control. We reject a lot of neurons because they don't uh, uh, pass either morphological quality control or electrophysiological quality control. But once they pass and all the data is made accessible in this very easy uh, format, you can, all, you can download all that data very easily. You can also download the various models in, in Hawk. Um, in, um, uh, you know, if you want to do neuron simulations or you can use for, for Python or Nest, you can download the, the, um, the, point, uh, the single point model reconstruction of, or, um, of these neurons. So, so, and so for each neuron, we have a variety of models available from, ve from very simple GLIFs, you know, the simplest being just an integrated file to more complicated ones to biophysical, simple to biophysical, very complicated ones. Now, uh, so I'll show you some data. We have reason to believe there are roughly 50 different cell types, at least in primary visual cortex. And so in principle, that gives rise to 2,500 cell type specific connectivities, right, which we call W alpha beta, where alpha and beta is an index that runs across all the cell types. So you know that the evidence seems to suggest that if you, let's say, record from a layer five thick tufted pyramidal cell, they, they make one type of synapses onto another layer five thick tufted pyramidal cell, but they make a different types of synapse that have a, has a different plasticity or a different average synaptic weight distribution onto a thin tufted layer five or onto a layer five inhibitory cell. And so we have to get all that data, which is of course expensive because it's, scale, it's a square. And then of course we also want to get the synaptic weight and synaptic properties of the afferent input, right? All the various thalamic areas, the subcortical areas, the other cortical areas, and the modulatory substances that modulate and influence the firing properties. And here by W alpha beta, what do I mean? I don't just mean the, synap I mean the synaptic weight, the probability distribution of the synaptic weight as a function of the distance, and then also plasticity. We know, of course, that plasticity rules are very important, particular short-term um, uh, synaptic facilitation and, fas um, and synaptic uh, depression. These are really critical to understand um, properties um, of a network, even in time courses as short as a couple of seconds, which is what we concentrate on. Again, we're focused on a specific, trying to understand specific behaviors, in our case, visual attention and visual object recognition over one or two action perception cycle. In other words, we're trying to understand what happens inside the brain of the, of the mouse as it's, you know, it runs along, it, it, the various targets, I'll show you moving, the various targets, sometimes it has to stop, sometimes not. We're trying to understand in detail what goes on under those conditions. We're using both uh, uh, structural data as well as uh, um, electrophysiological data. So this I just mentioned where we do sort of a patching with, with four patch or with eight patch to try to get this sort of data. In, in, again, in this is the wonder of transgenic technology, which we can't do in, in humans, of course, but in mouse you can do it, so you can label only you know, a subset of all the inhibitory cells in layer two, three, or you can uh, label the layer one uh, neurogliaform cells. And then now you can put a, for example, fluorescent reporter in, and now you can visualize them, they glow, they glow green, and so now you can precisely target them with and with electrodes, so you know you're recording, for example, from, from two um, you know, neogliaform cells in, in, in layer one. That's a wonder, and, and we really gotten very good at generating these, um, and these mice. Um, and then we're also using structural uh, data. So we are part of the MICRON uh, uh, program, the IAPA MICRON program with Clay Reed and Nuno da Costa. So we're doing very detailed reconstruction both array tomography as well as electromicroscopy of a, uh, again, of a one by one by one millimeter, um, uh, cubic millimeter of cortical tissue. So we're really trying to do every tool that we have available to really understand in detail to reconstruct this, right, where you cut every 40 nanometers, you've got 25,000 cuts, you have to detail reconstruct them, and then you have to annotate that. 
um, this one by one by one um, piece of this, this spec of brain matter. And then at the same time with Stephen Smith, we're using array tomography where you cut it in 70 nanometer slices, but then you use antibodies, multiple generation of antibodies that you can wash off. So we actually know these are GABAergic synapses, these are glutamergic synapses, these are noradrenergic synapses, so we can stain them and, re and, and know the identity of individual synapses. Yeah, so we're setting up this farm now of, um, of, um, of uh, um, electromicroscopic uh, platforms, so-called TEMCA, these arrays, camera, high-density cameras array with, uh, with transmission um, electromicroscopy. And then separately, we're setting up this array tomography. So here you can see this. So this allows you, for the, here we image the complete millimeter column. Uh, this is uh, a DAPI stain. You can see the individual cell bodies, and then we can zoom in closer and closer and closer. Now you can begin to see the antibody stains at the level of the individual synapses. So now here for the different colors, these are either excitatory or inhibitory, these are either pre or post synaptic targets. And we, are, we have a large informational team uh, that uses computer vision and we work with the Neuromancer group at Google to try to take all this data and do semi-automatic, I mean, the goal, of course, is to do completely automated, but that's still uh, in, in the future right now, to do a semi-automatic reconstruction. So that in this one by one by one millimeter of tissue, we not only have first imaged it, so we know in a from a behaving animal what the, pro what the receptor field properties of these neurons are, but then we cut it up and we, we know the detailed wiring using EM and using this sort of antibody technique, we also know the different types of, of, of synapses. And we know from our previous analysis of cell types, how these different cell types, how they behave at least under slice condition. Yeah, and so, so as I mentioned before, we're doing this multi-patching to try to understand the detailed properties of synapses, both chemical synapses as well as gap, um, as well as electrical uh, coupled synapses, and also to understand how these uh, synaptic connectivity properties change as a function of distance between the two neurons that you record from. Uh, currently, we believe the best way to characterize cell types is just to look at the genes that are expressed in their cells. You can now do this. There are now powerful techniques that allow you to do, finally, over the last three years, that allow you to do single cell transcription analysis, where you sequence essentially the RNA that's exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm for individual cells. Because ultimately, what we want to do for this one cell, we want to see which genes are expressed which 10 or 20,000 RNA, well, typically we do, we do three to five million to 10 million reads. We, we get the top 10,000 uh, RNA species that are expressed. At the same time, in the same cell, we want to do the electrophysiology and we want to reconstruct its morphology. So we can really understand how many, in these very high dimensional spaces now, transcriptional space, electrophysiological space, and morphological space, how many different clusters are there. So here we did this, this just came out last month, where we did this purely using transcription analysis, where we found 49 different cell types. So this is in primary visual cortex, and this is sort of expected, and the order of magnitude is, is not surprising. There are 42, um, very satisfying for a nerd like me, there are 42 neuron types. So the answer is actually 42. Um, we find there are 23 inhibitory ones, 23 GABAergic ones. They're, they're really essentially clustered in, in four large uh, families, somatostatin, VIP, and pavalmobin-expressing um, uh, neurons, and they express in different layers. And this is sort of all roughly compatible with, with what we know from, from, and from other data. And there are 19 different excitatory uh, cell types that differ by the genes it expressed. In some of these, we have also have morphology. What we have not done, because it's, it's, it's so far, it really hasn't been possible to do this routinely, where you do both transcriptional and physiological and morphological analysis at the same neuron and then do it at many hundreds or ultimately thousands of cells. So this has been 2,000 cells. To try to do it in a very large number of cells where you get the answer, uh, where you can combine, yes, by both transcriptional and where they project and the way they look and the way they uh, behave they all behave differently, and they're indeed 42 different cell, um, um, and different cell types. Now, we're in the process of doing the same transcriptional technique in other brain areas, in other cortical areas, because we really want to know how different is this number in other areas. Now, we're also doing this in humans. 
In humans, there are a few differences. So this is a neurosurgical tissue. We work now with five area, uh, local area neurosurgeons, and we any time now between once um, every week or once every two weeks, we get a piece of human brain. That's typically, you know, like my pinky here, sometimes it's a sugar cube. 20 minutes ago, or half an hour ago, depending on traffic, this piece of brain, you can see there, was part of somebody's living brain and, you know, maybe contained their um, memory of their first kiss. It's now sitting in our lab. Why? Because the, 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 um, the patient had a deep tissue uh, tumor. So here, for you, you can see where the yellow arrow points at. Um, for example, epileptic seizure or tumor, those are the two um, uh, pathologies we work with. And so to access that, that tissue to remove it, the surgeon has to cut in his way. So the, the surgeon has to tunnel essentially in. And then um, to, uh, to, uh, most of this tissue is discarded. Some of it is given to pathologists, most of it is discarded. So, so we take advantage of this now. And then we can do exactly, well, not exactly the same, but we can do similar techniques than we, that then we can do in mouse. Of course, we don't have Cree lines. We don't have transgenic uh, uh, um, you know, lines available, obviously, in humans. So we're now spending a lot of resources to develop very fast viral techniques that we can rapidly infect cells using, for example, um, herpes or other viruses, where we can infect the, the human cell with a particular promoter. So we know they carry a particular promoter, and we can differentiate them, and we can study the similarities or differences to, to, to these neurons in the, in, the, in the mouth. Basically, the neurons, you know, it's not a surprise. They look, they look similar, and they behave very similar. In fact, it turns out it's a really pleasant discovery we made. They're much easier to record, they're easier to record than, human, than mouse cells. They're larger, the cells, and more relevant, the slices last much longer because I suspect because of lifetime, right? So a human you know, typically will live 80 years, the mouse will live one year in the wild, and so the human tissue is much more robust and we can now routinely record two to three days from the human tissue and get physio uh, physiology to do morphological reconstruction, to do uh, then three-dimensional reconstruction and do the modeling. Um, it's been challenging to get, because uh, most of the tissue doesn't come from young mice, but comes from people who are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 years old. So it's quite a challenge to extract the, uh, the transcript, to do the RNA extraction. And so far, now we're working with uh, Illumina and um, the Craig Venter Institute to do mRNA from the, from the nucleus, which is sort of a, its own protected environment to also try to do transcriptional analysis. All right, then lastly, we're building, so I'm, I, 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 my early education is in physics, and of course in physics we have these wonderful, like the, the, the TMT 30 meter telescopes, the LHC, we have these wonderful observatories where you have thousands of people working um, to build instruments. We don't have that yet in biology, partly because the instruments are still much cheaper than an, uh, than an instrument like a, like a Hubble telescope or like a, like a, a high energy accelerator. Although that's changing as instrumentation becomes fancier and fancier, and you must do more and more controls in order to get high, highly reproducible, high quality data of the sort that's difficult to obtain in academics labs, where typically you get a beautiful paper uh, in nature with one PDF, a flat PDF, and you have to believe it or not, and there isn't really any, there really isn't any d deep data that you can follow up and that, and that you can mine, which of course also leads to the fact that two out of three biological experiments cannot be um, and can't be reproduced. So well, what we're trying to address that is to try to build these observatories where we take all the data, including all the metadata, try to do it again very reproducible, day in, day out the same, and make all the data and metadata available uh, to, and to the entire community. This helps us then to get feedback. People uh, spend a lot of time criticizing uh, in the data, both positively and negatively, which helps us to sort of to keep on improving the, and the data. All right, so that's our paradigm. You just saw our paradigm there. So we have this, uh, this training facility where we, where we train our mice in these visual tasks. It's a one-dimensional degree of freedom, so they run on this disk, and they've been trained by, by getting uh, water appropriately rewarded to, to, to do certain tasks, like, for example, recognize uh, grading of a particular orientation uh, and stop and, and lick to get some water or otherwise run past it. And then, for instance, of course, we want to show 
that uh, these parts of the brain that we study are actually causally involved. It's not just correlation like in an fMRI experiment of the sort I used to do in human, but we actually want to know that this area is actually causally involved. So again, it's a one of transgenic animals. We can put channel redoxin into, for example, the interneurons in V1. And then we can, um, we can pulse a light on there and to show on an individual trial that for that trial, if I turn off V1 for one, se for one second, the, the, the threshold of the animal shifts dramatically or, or the behavior goes, um, and goes completely away. So we can causally show um, that, 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 that various parts of the brain are actually involved in the task. Right? That's a great, that's a fantastic advantage that, opto, that these optogenetic tools have given us. Here, for example, we have a visual recognition a task where we train the animal to make a discrimination. It got trained on two objects, either mushrooms or birds, at different scales and different orientation, and it can generalize even to orientations or scales that it, it hasn't previously seen. So it does what we would in what, what in human psychophysics would be called translation or scale invariant um, object recognition. And now the question is given that task, you know, wh wh where are the neurons that are involved? We want to do that both throughout cortex as well as really focusing on primary visual cortex. We know, for example, so this is very similar to what uh, you know you would do in a in a human, there are this bevy of visual areas. Note the scale here, so one by one by one, uh, you know, one by one millimeter covers most of primary visual cortex. There are these other, there are roughly 12 different visual areas compared to 36 in us. We identify them now in each mice, and every mouse that goes into this observatory that we train, we know exactly where these functional areas are. Then we can do braid-wide recording, so we do both and we've got hours of this data, and it's really beautiful. For me, it's very tantalizing to put on some minimalist music or space music at night and then look at this. <laughs> well, because you can see, I mean, there's all sorts of things going on, and most of the time, we, we don't have any idea what's going on. There are, for example, these big spikes, right? You see them there? Nobody in the field has any idea what they are, and so they just block them out and average over them because we don't know what they are. are they, they, they don't seem to relate to heartbeat or to breathing or anything like that. It's some, it's some interesting signal, and so people, of course, typically what they do, you know, they only focus and they ignore everything else. But once you have this whole brain data, um, it's pretty cool. And now then we, we supplement that with very detailed data. So this is now data just looking in primary visual cortex. You can see the individual neurons. So we have, so of course we'd like to combine that to do the simultaneously whole brain imaging while also doing this very focused imaging. So we understand the context, at least at the mesoscopic scale of the entire brain on single trial, right? So this data and this previous data it's, it's all single trial data, right? So this is something totally impossible to do in, in, in humans where you would have to average over many, many trials. This is a single trial of one animal running. And you can see, yeah, so they are recording from those specific locations. That's its running speed. There you can see the, the, the video. And this plus all the other metadata, you know, the eye movement, the pupil size, all of that is going to be made available to, to everybody. All right, and then um, lastly, we're trying to make very quantitative models of this um, to really try to reproduce our own data just like dog food, you eat your own dog food, to really try to reproduce our own data with our own models. And of course, to also put all of this stuff outside so other people um, you know, can, can also reproduce it and, and you know, hopefully or maybe even do better than we do. So here the challenge is that we don't just want to reproduce what you typically do in where you have one experiment, you build a model for to, to replicate that one experiment. But here the challenge is we have huge amount of data. So we have the structural data from EM and from array tomography. We have the mesoscopic data, so we, we, we know this, let's say V1, all the different areas it gets input to and then projects out. We have the cell type data, right, so we know what the different cell types that make up primary visual cortex, how they behave electrically speaking in their local morphology and their axons. Um, and then we have the functional data that we get through tools like this. We're also supplementing that, I don't have time to show that, we ha we're building, as part of this IMAC consortium, with um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, we're building these, uh, we have built these very high density probes where we have up to 962 um, at sites 20 micrometer apart to sample electrically up to 20 kilohertz 
because the trouble with the, with the imaging data, it's at a very slow scale. It's either 7 hertz or 30, uh, 30 hertz. And of course, you don't see spikes. You see calcium signals. And so there is this link. We're patching at the same in some other experiment with trying to understand quantitatively the link between the electrical activity and the calcium activity, but they're not one and the same. So that's the advantage you want to use also to combine that with electrophysiology, where you get very high temporal fidelity data. Right, up to 20 kilohertz, so you can look at high frequency oscillations and gamma and all of that and synchrony. But the drawback of electrophysiology, you don't know anything about the, uh, about the genetic identity. That's the advantage of using two, um, optical um, uh, um, transgenic animals where you put um, um, a G-camp uh, um, um, in a specific cell type. And so we, we, we want to reproduce all these different things and put them all together and to make sure that we really can say we understand this quantitatively. And so we get responses in the visual case. We have these various classical stimuli, you know, the gratings, the isolated noise, uh, bars, etc. Then we have natural images and we also show natural movies to try to reconstruct now at different levels of resolution from biophysical very detailed to biophysical less detailed with, uh, with passive dendrites. We're also interested, of course, in computing the local field potential, I have done so over the last years, then to point models and then to, to statistical models to try to, to try to understand what type of model do you need to answer what sort of question. In order, for example, to replicate this, do you need dendrites, yes or no? And so, you know, so here this is a, this is a simulation just of layer, um, this sort of just an interim report here. This is a simulation of a layer four population of very detailed models, uh, 50,000 of them. That's roughly all the cells in layer four in, in V1. The other good thing, we have all these numbers now. Right? We, we're not estimating, but we actually have good, we have, we're beginning to get really good numbers of how many neurons are there in this particular brain of this particular animal. And so we can reproduce, so the, these are the various, these are the, the, the cellular responses in response to showing these images. And so we can re, um, reproduce that using, using different models. So that's work in progress. We'll also release that uh, next year together with the entire simulation environment. So, so uh, that's sort of an update. We, we work with uh, a large number of people. It's very easy to work with us since we don't really have a lot of IP, et cetera, um, um, and other restriction. We, we work extensively with, um, with, P, um, with, uh, with academia, both here and, uh, and abroad. And uh, because sort of part of our DNA is to make everything we do is to enable to further accelerate, um, accelerate scientific discovery um, for the benefit of us all, including for the benefit, ultimately, of mankind. And that's uh, some of our group. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Paul G. Allen and his sister Jody for funding all of this effort. And with that, I thank you for your attention. That's a good uh, section of mankind right there. Uh, Christoph, your 10,000 cell layer 4 v1 uh, simulation, or, or any of your simulations, how do you, not just the statistics of average probability of connectivity, but how precisely do you choose to connect the cells? And in particular, if in the real mouse or the real human, two stellates respond to a 30 degree bar, are they more likely to be connected? And how do you arrange that? Yeah, so, so we now know that. I mean, there was, there was physiological data, and we just, uh, Clay Rees just publishing a paper in Nature to show that if neurons are similar neurons of, of similar orientation, have uh, A, are more likely to be connected than if they're dissimilar, and also they are, the, the synaptic size is larger. If, if, if you're similar than if you're dissimilar orientation. We don't have learning right now. So we, we, we put in these, uh, so we put in statistical properties, right? Measuring this over and over again, we have statistical distribution and we sample from those distribution. Ultimately, Paul, I think what you're probably driving at, we, we want ultimately a developmental program and that's a totally separate effort we're doing to wire all the thing up and by itself, which, which right now we're not doing for this particular project because that's ultimately what you want, of course. Yeah, so I'll talk to you about it next time we, we have a break. It's something that, that DARPA funded us to do for a few years is exactly such a system, and uh, it would be great to put it to use.
Uh, hello, I have a question about dendrites. So you mentioned that um, in your thinking, there's some functions of the cortex that you can perform without dendrites, and for some you might actually need dendrites. What's your current thinking as to the delineation between those two groups of functions? Well, it really depends. I mean, we know there's all sorts of, I mean, I did this for my PhD many, many years ago, probably before you were born. There's all sorts of cool things you can do in dendrites. The question is, what do they actually do in mouse visual cortex? There's some evidence that they're involved to help sharpen orientation selectivity. So one question is, do we need to put in act, uh, dendrites, and A, is it passive, or do we even need to put in active dendrites to replicate some of the uh, orientation selectivity? 